I wanted to brew lager beers, um, and a, the reason was pretty personal, and that is the, I wanted to make a really good Pilsner. And for the past seven years, owner Rick Allen has been doing just that. Peter Allen specializes in producing distinctive all malt lager and other German and Czech style beers. Rick and his daughter Lisa brew in McMinnville, Oregon at their six fermenter location. And I really was disappointed with, with the American versions that I tasted and the European versions that I got just didn't taste fresh, you know, or like they did when you were when I was in Europe. I think there were a lot of challenges because because we're brewing German style beers, and so um, you know, Germans brew beers differently than Brit than the British people do, and the British people are what we tend to emulate when we, as craft brewers, are making beer. And so most of the brewing systems out there are set up for making ales, and and brewing in a British style, and brewing in a German style is totally different, and really requires. Um, you know, a, a whole different way of looking at things, and, and you know, quite frankly, I just lucked out um, that I happened to get a system that would allow me to modify it so that it would work for what we wanted to do. If you're a home brewer, um, which I was, you know, usually you're kind of like you get this wild look in your eye, and you think, okay, I'm going to brew this, and I'm going to brew that, and you know, and, and and I was doing that. I mean, I was, I'm going to brew a pale ale, I'm going to brew a um, you know, a Christmas beer, and it's going to be huge. You know, and I'm going to and I'm going to add spruce tips to it, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, um, and and that's all well and good. But um, with me starting out and looking at doing it commercially, I wanted to work on brew house procedure, and I wanted to work on just one style. That so I brewed 14 batches of Pilsner in a row because everyone told me that was the hardest thing to brew. And, and I just brewed it over and over and over again. And I tweaked the yeast and I, you know, tweaked the recipe a little bit and, and uh, you know, maybe, you know, changed the hop formulation and, you know, when, when we added hops and all that type of stuff and, and just played around with it and really got to understand all of the different inputs and all, at the same time got to work on my brew house procedure so that I could ensure that, that, you know, everything came out like it was supposed to every time. You know, because a lot of times if you're a home brewer, it doesn't always come out the way you expect it to, but it's okay because you're only doing it once. And so it's like, well, yeah, but that's what I guess I really meant to do, you know. <laughs> Uh, at like 35 degrees 
for for the next six months where it uh, the, the, the beer resolves itself the yeast continues to work on the beer um, any uh, tannins and other things we don't want the beer tend to fall out uh, and we end up with a nice crisp clean clear beer this is one of our cold rooms um, where we are again storing the beer um, each one of these tanks holds nine barrels of beer which is roughly 270 gallons um, these are what we will bottle or keg out of uh, when the beer is finally ready. Uh, if you'll notice on the, on the tanks, we put down the date that we brew the beer. Uh, we then also have a date where we rack the beer. Uh, that is the date that we switch it from one tank to another to clear out any any uh, yeast or other uh, things we don't want in the beer at, at, collected at the bottom of the tank. So we clear that out so that we have nice, clean, clear, nine, nice, clean, clear beer. graduated from Oregon State in 2005 um, with a degree in archaeology <laughs> and uh, I knew I didn't want to go to grad school right away so I actually um, went and traveled to New Zealand and um, then when I came back um, I worked at um, Pelican uh, Pub and Brewery on the coast and kind of I'd always been interested in craft beer and kind of got um, it was cool working at like a brew pub and where the beers are really good and stuff like that. Second, I worked two summers at Pelican. The second, after the second summer I worked there, my parents were moving to McMinnville because I think that was around the time when my dad was starting the brewery. And I worked harvest at a winery. Um, and uh, then I actually went to, I had all intentions of going to grad school actually. Um, and then uh, I, um, worked at a winery and then actually went to New Zealand and worked at a winery in New Zealand and decided I didn't want to go to grad school for <laughs> for um, historic preservation that I wanted to get in the wine industry so um, when I came back after working harvest in New Zealand I um, got a job at Argyle Winery and then um, worked actually in the tasting room there and took classes at Schmeckata through their wine, the wine program there and then um, after working a year there, I uh, decided to go down and work harvest in Napa. And um, I had like these grand plans of maybe going to Australia or something the next winter um, to work harvest there. And my dad actually asked me if I would come work at the brewery. And um, so I decided to work at the brewery. I had like, I thought that it was going to be a short time that I would be here and it's been like three and a half years now so and I, I mean I consider this my career now. I mean the one thing I do think that has been really really helpful is is that Lisa has a really good palate and and once I get her trained on how to do recipes, you know, how to formulate recipes, then look out. There's definitely different flavors and stuff that you get from beer than that you get from wine, but, um, and in so sometimes I think it's more even subtle in beer than it is in wine, um, but I mean, it's just, it's just learning how to taste, and if you learn how to taste wine or beer, no matter what it is, you can go kind of back and forth. The presence of bread or pretend Britannomyces, it's like, it's a yeast that it's, you don't want it in your wine at all, and it kind of smells and tastes like, um, but it's almost like horse saddle, like, that's, it's a weird way to describe it, but that's the best I could do, um, and those type of beers are kind of popular that are infected with Britannomyces, and I just can't, every time I smell one, I just think it, like, harkens me back to those wine days where I'm just like, this should be here, this should not be here, this should not be in something that I like drinking and so um, but I think more than anything uh, kind of having the palate for wine has helped in beer you know as you age your senses tend to kind of fall by the wayside and so I might taste something and, and think it tastes wonderful or I might taste something and and um, you know and not pick up on something whereas she's gonna pick up on it 
Um, and so, you know, we're starting to, to look at, at developing some recipes together. She, she and I kind of collaborated together on, on developing the recipe for Bobtoberfest this year. And that's the first time she's really taken an active role in, in talking about what malts we use and, and how, what percentages of the malts we use and what we do about hopping and all that type of stuff. When we were younger we thought everyone was on our side Then we grew a little and romanticized the time I saw flowers in your hair I want to keep the, the distribution chain as short as possible. Um, the closer I can get to my customer, the better off I'm going to be. Um, you know, in terms of, and the better off, uh, the better off the customer's experience is going to be, and the better off you know, my business is going to be. And so, um, you know, we, we self-distribute. We basically do it all ourselves. Um, we deliver all the beer, so we know all the people in all, in all the supermarkets we, or the grocery stores that we sell at. We know the people at the restaurants that, that we sell beer at. Um, we also can ensure that the beer gets to the, the, the customer in the best possible shape. I mean, usually when we're delivering kegs, uh, they were in a tank until a, a day or two before we're ma we make the delivery, in most cases. Um, and with the bottles, you know, well, and everything we do is refrigerated constantly until it gets delivered to the stores you know and and I mean to us freshness is is paramount you know to, to what we're doing in time I mean uh, if it ends up sitting out on a loading dock at 90 degree day for for a, you know all day you know who knows what it's going to taste like um, I'm not really interested in finding out uh, so we we try to do it ourselves and and do it um, you know and, and do it as as you know, with, with, with res as much respect for the beer as we possibly can. Let's put it that way. Yeah, delivering is, uh, that is one thing definitely, I think even more so than brewing, that I don't think a lot of women do, especially deliver kegs and stuff. So I have gotten reactions before, like, I've never seen a girl take a keg downstairs. Um, Sarah Vesa, really cool bar in Portland, um, but they have these, like, rickety wooden stairs that you have to take the kegs down. <laughs> So, but they're always very nice. I'm always like, can I get some help carrying the cakes down? And they're all really, they're really nice about helping me because it's really hard to even take like a trolley thing, a cart down with you. So yeah. we usually, two of us will like kind of carry it down the stairs. As far as restaurants are concerned, um, I th we try to focus on fine dining as much as we can. Um, we think that our beers go really, really well with, with a variety of foods um, and, and can really complement you know, a dining experience, and so we want to be at places like Castagna and Genoa, um, you know, where, that carry our beer, or Firehouse up in North Portland, um, you know, and, and places like that. Um, and, and so that's been the focus. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, we, we have to provide beer to anyone who calls up and asks for it as long as we have beer to sell. And so um, we have relationships, too, with a number of taverns, mm -hmm. you know, so like there's a place called the Gold Dust Meridian on Hawthorne. They have our beer. Um, there's a little place just off of Belmont called the Side Street Tavern. They have our beer. And there's a place up on Alberta, uh, Binks, that has our beer. Um, and so we, we kind of run the gamut um, of places. Um, they tend to be small. They tend to be locally owned. Um, you know, the big chains aren't interested in us, and we're not really particularly interested in them. One thing that I think is really cool about what we do here um, and is that we do make something different than most other people do and um, I do think that is really cool and I like being part of something where um, I mean people because everything we do is so different I mean people come up to me and they're like hey Alan, I love that beer you guys make the best pills and that just I love that. It's great. It's like, oh, thanks. Big deal. I mean, one of the things that um, has becomes very frustrating is when you can't keep up with demand. And and we have. I mean, it's just like that telephone call I just had. You know, sorry, we don't have any beer. 
um, maybe next week <laughs> we'll have some beer, but we don't have any beer this week. And, and so, you know, part of what we want to do is try to get to the point where we can, can make, you know, enough beer to kind of keep up with, with demand. In an effort to keep up with the increasing demand for their beers, Rick and Lisa have decided to upgrade their system to a 15 barrel brewing system. The installation is scheduled to be completed by September 2013 at the latest. I want to do anything that's going to, um, that's going to not meet our standards and we don't want to take any shortcuts I mean, or, or anything else. We want to try to, to make our beer the same way we're making it now, just make it on a bigger system. Uh, you know, the big guys are, are you know, you're, you're not considered a big guy unless you do at least 15,000 barrels. And, and there are about 100 of those. Um, you know, brewing companies in the, in the United States that are, are bigger than that. And so, um, you know, when you look down the list, we're way down the list <laughs> as far as, you know, size-wise. And, and even with this expansion, you know, that might get us up so that we're doing 1,500 um, barrels a year. Um, and that's about as far as, as we can foresee right now. You know, maybe at some point we can bump that up to 2,000 or something. But but, um, you know, I, I really think that, that getting to 1500 is going to be, you know, a nice size for us to, you know, have a profitable business um, and, and be able to serve our markets and still be able to, you know, kind of not compromise our standards. And, and like I said, that's the most important thing.